Good morning, I'm Noel Lim. Today on Spotlight, we explore what it means to suffer from a mental health condition and how some organisations support their employees. That was Kim Jong-un, Korean pop star. Killed himself a week before Christmas. He was 27. He had everything, fans, money, fame. Yet he suffered from depression. Enough to want to take his life. The World Health Organization recognises mental illness or neurological disorder as an epidemic. It can hit anyone as there are multiple causes, trauma and stress caused by life experiences, as well as physiological and genetic factors. It traps people in unhappiness and anxieties, and over time can lead to chronic pain and suicide. In Malaysia, about 30% of adults have experienced mental health issues such as stress, depression, anxiety and burnout. More severe disorders are post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Mental illness is expected to be the second biggest health problem after heart disease in Malaysia by next year. This is hardly surprising when you consider what's in the pipeline. Among adolescents, two in five suffer anxiety, one in five are depressed, one in ten have suicidal thoughts. One of them would have been Zulaika Mohammad, co-founder of Mindakami, a youth mental health organisation. Since leaving high school, Zulaika had experienced depression and eventually mood swings, when as a second-year student in university, she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder type 2. I was anxious a lot about my future. I was anxious, you know, I had a, a crush on someone and I, I didn't know what that meant. And, and I noticed that I would sleep a lot, lie in my bed, um, having really intrusive thoughts and having crying spells that came to a breaking point where I felt like I needed help because it was hard for me to go to classes to function and do my assignments and just basically take care of my needs, take care of myself. A lot of the times I felt like what I was going through was something normal that everyone was going through and therefore I should be able to get over with it. So that was like my initial thought that hindered me for so long to seek for professional help. But after talking about it, talking through with the, with my best friend, she kind of encouraged me to take that really scary step. Sometimes wish I would have, you know, gotten help earlier because that would have helped a lot. It took Zulaika a while to recognise and admit she had mental health symptoms, despite studying psychology at the time. She is not alone. There is a general lack of understanding and stigma about mental health issues, which may cause people to doubt themselves or do and say something that is unhelpful to someone who is unwell. Um, I told someone really close to me that um, I was having really bad suicidal thoughts and that's something that's quite regular for me, especially if I'm going through a really tough time. And how they responded is, um, they asked me, what do you gain from thinking about suicide? Like, it caught me really off guard because at that time I was basically breaking down and sobbing and telling the person that, you know, it's really hard for me to find meaning in life and I feel like there's no point going on any further. What people should know is that it's not something that you choose to do. It's not like... I was like, okay, I'm going to think about this. But it just happens to you and you don't really understand it. And for people to question whether that is valid or not and to ask those unhelpful questions, it really makes you feel even worse. There was also the experience of copywriter Daksha Yani Batmanadan. She was 27 when she was diagnosed with clinical depression. I started to notice that I wasn't able to cope well at work and I would have these breakdowns. I was unable to even step out of my car and get into the office where I finally, you know, I couldn't put it off anymore because I couldn't understand what was happening. I just felt like, oh, maybe you're just being overly emotional or you can get over it. Don't worry about it. Don't overthink it. And at the end of the year is when um, I think I had hit a level where I 
found it very difficult to get back up. And I spoke to a doctor friend of mine who suggested that I should see someone professionally. Perhaps we think people in need are deliberately seeking attention. Or we tell them to suck it up and deal with it. Quite common in Asian society, even if it is well-intentioned. You just need to think positive, you know. Stop, stop thinking all the negative stuff and, you know, just kind of telling you to get over it, which I kind of understood at the time, but it was um, very difficult because most of the time when you're in that kind of state, you're very critical of your own self. So if people can find, you know, something wrong with me, I can find 10 times more things wrong with me. In addition to providing employee assistance program, options for reassignment and time off up to two years, Shell aims to destigmatize mental health issues. It has run campaigns to create more awareness and to help staff spot signs and symptoms in themselves and others. Shazmi Ali, Country Human Resource Director at Shell Malaysia, says this helps foster more empathy and encourages early intervention. We have this entire campaign that says uh, it's okay to say I'm not okay. And it's not only about you taking the first step in identifying that I have an issue. It's also your peers or your managers identifying that well, maybe there might be something that uh, is troubling you. Are you okay? You know, having those kind of first-line uh, intervention, at least to show care, uh, is very important. Because you're right, sometimes uh, even if I realize I'm having a bit of stress or you know, am I having an anxiety disorder, I might be denying in my mind that I don't have it. But someone else can come and uh, tell me about it and then can encourage me to speak to the relevant, uh, relevant people. Senior managers at Shell have also opened up to talk about their condition and become role models. Global-based leaders who have come up openly and shared they used to suffer from a medical condition, uh, bipolar, etc. And they talk about how by opening up, uh, it has helped them uh, a lot. Uh, in their career journey. And I think that's a really good start because once uh, colleagues see that, oh, actually my boss's boss's boss had a condition that I used to have and she still managed to build her career, having leaders coming out to share their journey, I think that is a very powerful tool. While mental health campaigns are useful, Shazmi is also mindful not to go overboard. The intention should be to normalise the situation. If I have an event just the entire day on mental health, then it becomes like, oh, almost very deliberate that the leader has to speak about it. But I'd rather do it in, a, in an environment where it's a regular town hall, right? We do twice a year the chairman's town hall. And in one of those uh, town halls, leaders saying that we, had, we, we made a mistake, these are the stress that we are facing, and we've had leaders who are open enough to share that. A senior person who, who said, I'm reflecting whether am I causing stress in the organization. And I think that's a powerful uh, statement to, to say. That's a powerful realization uh, by the leader uh, you know, themselves to say, wait, wait, if there is stress in the organization, how many percent of it is contributed by me? At 27, analyst Edika Amin started experiencing depression and anxiety, which then led him to suffer from chronic pain and having to take leave from work. I would just have trouble sleeping. So I wake up exhausted. So I'd have like these prolonged periods of constant sadness and emptiness. I was also very self-critical. I had this kind of feeling of worklessness and hopelessness. And then um, it kind of started affecting my work as well because I had trouble remembering things and early signs of anxiety. And what that led, eventually led to is loss of appetite and loss of energy. So I finally decided to seek help in January 2018. I scheduled myself to see a psychiatrist at Hospital University of Malaya. After that first session, I was immediately prescribed medicine. Unfortunately, I think I was given the wrong treatment within that time. So within that period up till March, um, there was constant brain fog. I experienced significant weight loss. Uh, I think I lost about 11 kilograms in a period of about three months. And then that's when the anxiety and the panic attacks started hitting hard as well. So during that period, I was already diagnosed with clinical depression and anxiety. Edika has been recovering. Now that he's in a full-time job, how does he manage when he feels low and overwhelmed? Set reasonable deadlines for you to manage everything. And that, that would help as well because sometimes you're loaded with so many things and you don't know, what do I do first? How do I prioritize? One of the things that I've learned throughout the years is also to kind of speak up. So when there are things that if it's getting a bit too heavy, you kind of just to mention to your bosses. If one is not feeling well and is unable to work, a colleague may have to take on extra responsibilities. How does Edika navigate the situation and what are the potential stress points? 
if it does get a bit too hard, I think that's the whole essence of teamwork. And uh, that's something that needs to be portrayed in the workplace more. Like everything's negotiable in terms of deadlines. It's something that you just need to have a frank conversation about. But I, I think it's also important that we address the uniqueness of the working environment now. Because this is for the first time in history, we have four different generations in the workforce. So you have everybody from the baby boomers up to the millennials where everybody has a different way of thinking, different way of perception. So it makes communication a little bit more trickier as well. From the way that I'm working now, honesty is the best policy. I don't, I, I'm not ashamed to show my weaknesses and tell people that there is certain capacities that I'm not able to do at this moment. But then it, go, it also goes down to the individual if they're willing to kind of accept their weaknesses and be frank in that sense. On the upside, any tensions that arise are opportunities for workplaces to re-examine their culture, work processes and productivity. Number one is we need to kind of make both employers and employees accountable. And by this, we kind of put it within the DNA of the institution. So instead of saying providing a very competitive or high-pressure environment, maybe a conducive environment. Um, it's just the kind of wording that they choose to make it a bit more of a safe space for everyone. But the second thing is that I think a lot of institutions are rolling out these wellness programs on mental health, but I, there's no like clear direction on what they're trying to achieve with this. Uh, what they usually get is that the insurance companies usually send them a report and they kind of show what's the main spending that's being spent. And if spending on mental health is far exceeding critical illness, maybe it's time for you to communicate directly with the staff. So in, in that sense, people who are suffering from it, they know that they're not alone. And then uh, the third part is probably a little bit more of a balance because if you look at in terms of productivity, you have countries like Norway, Germany, Ireland who rank on top of that because and they work the least amount of hours, but they're the most productive. And they also have that kind of striking the balance between work-life balance boundaries. For instance, uh, communication. If it's not extremely urgent, it can probably wait till the next day. Today on Spotlight, we explore the topic of mental health. Stay tuned. In this episode of Spotlight, we are looking into mental health issues, a growing epidemic worldwide and in Malaysia. Safety-sensitive organisations such as airlines have to adhere to robust standards and support their staff with potential mental health conditions. What can we learn from their training? It starts with having a no-blame culture, says Captain Nazaruddin Abu Bakar, head of MAB Academy, the training arm of Malaysian Airlines. Pilot as well as cabin crew, we do have a programme what we call the crew resource management where um, we cover in handling or identifying stress, for instance. Uh, we also cover, like, uh, in terms of communication among the peers, and we'll cover about the teamwork, saying that if you identify a symptoms of stress from your peers, we maintain what we call the just culture, and this is the no-blame policy. The training also educate our people, both the cabin crew and also the flight crew, in understanding if our peers are not performing as per the required safety or I would say required procedures by the manuals that we have derived. And it's a continuous training all the time, mostly for the pilots. It's also been checked in our six monthly check um, in the simulator as well. Malaysia Airlines has gone through management changes, reorganisations, job cuts and had to deal with MH370 and MH17 tragedies. There were also questions about the mental states of the pilots who flew MH370. What has Malaysia Airlines done to step up on awareness and intervention? Additional awareness about mental health to the people, especially to the pilots and the crew uh, to be exact, re-emphasise uh, the topic of uh, crew resource management to the crew uh, very frequent. Uh, for us, it's very important, and uh, by educating these people, we, we want to ensure that they are open in reporting themselves or even open reporting for others. For any cabin crew who has been found to have a clinical condition, and depending on the severity, arrangements can be made to transfer them to non-safety critical roles. In such roles, how will Malaysia Airlines assess whether to hire or to retain someone who has been clinically diagnosed to be unwell? Datuk Dr. Razin Kamarul Zaman, Head of Corporate Safety Oversight and also the airline doctor at Malaysia Airlines, considers several factors. The more uh, difficult cases are where it's an organic uh, depression, where there is an uh, element of uh, hereditary uh, genetic uh, involvement, so uh, this, this type of depression is a bit more difficult to manage and it really needs a good specialist care and um, 
uh, cooperation from the patient themselves to be compliant to the medication. It takes time through, um, but we value the training and the capability of uh, the staff that we have. And uh, as much as possible, we cater for them to return to work and uh, uh, work with us. Companies are now emphasising resilience when they interview job candidates. Dr. Razin believes the capacity to recover from difficulties is critical, especially in an organisation like Malaysia Airlines. The main philosophy or principles is to get uh, the, the individuals who are resilient. Training is important, uh, repeated training and training which to, to create their proficiency and competency. Um, a lot of organisations are shifting towards that nowadays instead of uh, managing the consequence of uh, uh, effects of uh, unable to cope at work. We look at selecting the right individual for the right job. Shell may have done away with requiring job candidates to undergo any medical checkups, mental or physical. Like Malaysia Airlines, it looks out for resilience. So we, we do ask questions directly and indirectly about uh, resilience in the past, but that's about it. We don't read subtle clues because a lot of times, and I, I'm a HR professional for 20 years, I will tell you a lot of times when we look for subtle clues, we look at things wrongly. And then your unconscious bias comes in and say, you know, I like this guy or I don't like this guy. Edika Amin, whom we spoke to earlier, has changed his lifestyle and is recovering from clinical depression. Early in his treatment, he was prescribed unsuitable drugs. He has since switched psychiatrists. He tells us what his doctor prescribes. Style changes in terms of the diet that I was taking. He asked me to eat a bit more clean. He asked me to start hitting the gym, um, kind of like getting out that negative energy. And then there were also some uh, religious elements that he put in to kind of like uh, feed the soul in a sense. I needed to forgive myself because a lot of times the people who suffer from mental health is that they kind of have this self-resentment because they feel weak, they're, they're questioning why this is happening to them and not others. I learned to be kind to myself, so I understand my limits and I understand when it comes to a point if I need to kind of step away, take a short break, I do that. It's also an opportunity to ask what really matters to us in life. How should we redefine success and happiness? After recovering from depression, Dakshayani Batmanadan, whom we spoke to earlier, finds purpose in sharing her experiences. Silent dream of mine, which I've not really told anybody about. This thing that, you know, has always been in the back of my mind. And now that I have been a little bit more exposed, do like I would love to get into the mental health like what are the ways to actually help people not after they can eat but you know is there a way for us to help people before they reach that point Meanwhile Zulaika Muhammad Minda Kami is turning her experience into something that could help young people through her podcast Borak Minda Try to do a range of projects and that includes talking about our own experiences through social media because three of our four, four founders are people who uh, are diagnosed with a mental illness, so that's what we try to do. And I try to do that as well on my own Twitter account and also the podcast where I give um, general mental health information, but I do sometimes talk about my own mental illness as well and what I go through and what have benefited me throughout my journey. The conversations about mental health is not only about recognising symptoms. It compels us to question our humanity and understanding about the human condition, our deeply rooted assumptions and attitudes towards people whom we perceive to be different. The recent movie Joker shows us the pain of existing in, in an uncaring world, of not being heard, understood and accepted. The struggle is invisible, but it is real. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Noel Lim on Spotlight, BFM 89.9. To smile and put on a happy face.